Welcome to the Three Piece Podcast, a show where three Call of Duty amateurs discuss player development to improve your in-game performance. New episodes every Monday at 7 a.m. EST to start your week off with a scoop of inspiration. Uh, that's probably what it is. I mean, I'm going to get a Chris Radio logo on my mask. Wear that around work. <laughs> so, speaking of your, your logo, so how often do you stream? It's like, uh, not enough. Not I've been enough? I told myself I was gonna stream every day until the Cold War, but that kind of fell through. I just, I don't. Okay, the problem is I don't have an Elgato right now, so, and my whole brand's kind of built around COD. So streaming PC games every day is just kind of a drag. Like I streamed to like yeah. three viewers, and like, like I stream COD, and I'll have at least like, I don't know, like fifteen, twenty viewers usually if yeah. I'm playing something. Maybe more if I'm playing something important, but like. P- no one wants to watch me play Valorant, bro. Like I'm horrible. Like I'm not good. Like nobody, like nobody wants to watch that. Dude, do you remember when I used to stream Fortnite, bro? Like me and you, we, I actually yeah, me and viewers, Liam bro. used to grind uh, yeah, Fortnite for yeah. a little bit. We were we actually pretty good, viewers. okay. Do you remember in the, you remember in like the the qualifiers? I got 50 viewers, and then you got like oh, yeah, 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 crazy yeah. shit. It was, Nothing it was tops cool. viewership like for like challengers tournaments though. Like when I would stream 2Ks and stuff at the beginning of Black Ops 4, when my stream was popping. I, I think I maxed out like 200 viewers one time. Like. Oh, shit. Those always pull hell of viewers. I remember that. when uh, Renown like paid to play with me, and we play and I played that hundred dollar chow for free. Yes, I remember. We that. Won. Yeah, bro, I pulled so many viewers. I pulled like a hundred and <laughs> like just like the other time I uh, pulled a lot of viewers is when we uh, chowed hundred thieves at the beginning of Black Ops Four. Oh, I remember that, and we smoked them. We actually yeah. beat hundred thieves. I'm not kidding. I, first week. Yeah, like the first week of BF4, me and yep. Liam played with like Tommy. Absolutely. I don't even know Ollie and someone someone else, someone else yeah. and we beat him. We, I had a viral oh, clip Lunar, like I'm sure. Yeah, Lunar. we played with Lunar as well. Yeah, yeah that's it was. Yeah, I saw you. That was good from, times. Uh, it was blackout that went viral too. That's your pin. Yeah, I, see, I, that, I, I, I screwed up so bad. I had like two viral clips of the Mio before. I was I just turned 18, so my stock was up. Like everything was going great for me, and I was teamed with good players. Had like a kind of shitty event at Vegas, and then I just quit like an idiot. I mean, at least you kind of realized that you had something going for you, because a lot of people would have been in that situation and not even realized that, like... Oh, I definitely knew, yeah. like, that the stars had aligned and, like, shit was going right. I thought I was about to be simp for a second, and then, you know, <laughs> shit happened. <laughs> My problem is I just threw it away and quit for six months. But I've regained a little bit, and I'm... Are you I don't okay know. with sharing what you learned in that six months of quitting? Oh, uh, I okay, so the way... I feel like a lot of people think this way, too... I, when I quit, I was always, for a while anyway, it's not like this anymore, but I was always so much happier. Like, I was like, bro, like, why do people, like, why do people compete? Like, why do, why do I always do this myself? I'm 10 times happier not competing, you know, like just going about day to day life. But then I started to realize that it's not the competing aspect that makes me unhappy. It's the fact that you kind of have to find a balance. You can't just, like, I was waking up every day getting on, playing 12 hours of COD, going to bed. I didn't have a job. I wasn't doing anything else. I wasn't working out. I was eating like shit. Like, that shit, that stuff matters. I don't know if I can cuss, by the way. I, yeah, I don't no, know if that's a problem. Ahead, but... ahead, I don't matter. Okay. Uh, but, like, that stuff really matters, you know? And people don't realize that. They think, like, oh, the only way I'm going to go pro or the only way I'm going to make it is if I just get on and play for 15 hours a day. Like, I honestly think it's worse on you to do that than it is, like, in a benefit way. Yeah. So I, I really learned that I just kind of have to find a balance when I do this. And I, I found that out at the beginning of uh, Modern Warfare. Well, not at the beginning. So at the beginning of Modern Warfare, because I turned 18 in Black Ops 4, okay? I quit, like I said. And then I came back, quit again at the beginning of Modern Warfare after like the first two two days, like an idiot. But after that second experience, it took two times. It took me like screwing up twice to finally figure it out. But I've kind of came back and realized that you just have to find a balance. You can't just play COD all day. I... Uh, and another thing is, I feel like a lot of people our age kind of put all their eggs into one basket, you know? Like, they want to, obviously your dream is to become a competitive Call of Duty player, you want to be in the pro league, blah, blah, blah. But you kind of just have to have a backup plan, in my opinion. You can't, I, mean, I guess if you're in a position to where your parents are like fully support you, it's fine. But in my opinion, you should be doing something on the side as well, in case this goes wrong. Because it's just, it can go really, really bad for you if you don't, you see players still living at home in their 20s like mid 20s with nothing i mean literally the only thing they're working towards is cod and that's i mean i'm all for like i'm completely for the whole chasing your dreams and like screw the nine to five and all that stuff but i don't know you just have to you have to prioritize your time in a beneficial way i guess is what i learned the most 
Yeah, so do you think that that could transfer into, if you're streaming like you are personally, or mm-hmm. for example, use me as an example, uh, if I were content creating, you know, uploading YouTube videos, etc. If someone were in either of our positions and they wanted to just say full send it, and do you think they would have an advantage over the people that are, you know, maybe working from, from my instance, 7 to 3, and then mm-hmm. go straight to the game versus they create that content all day and then they scram they play their tournaments or whatever do you think they'd be at that advantage because they also get that content or do you think they're just going to burn out like we were saying like you know it helps have that balance uh what do you what do you think about that from my experience i definitely think they burn out way quicker than someone who's kind of doing both like at this point i work third shift so i work at night sleep in the morning and then from like 12 to like 11 30 is 11 straight hours of me putting in time to what i want to do whether it's content competing you know anything like that so in my personal experience i think it's way better for you and even if it's not working even if it's just you know going outside and working out like do, doing something other than just one thing you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. i think that's more important than anything else because when you're just doing one specific thing and when, when you're just doing one specific thing for 15 hours a day it's just not i don't think it's beneficial for you at all to be honest there, I don't really know what you would be doing if if you're, say, like, for me, if you're competing. I don't know what 15 hours, what you're going to do in 15 hours in a day that's really going to benefit you in the long run. Like, you should be scrimming. You should be playing some aids. Like, yeah, but 15 hours, like, you could definitely prioritize, like, segments of time throughout the day to do other things as well. So, no, I don't think anyone would have an advantage in that situation. Like, I think for someone like you or me that's working, I have just as much of an opportunity to make this a career as someone who's sitting at home and just grinding god you know what i'm saying yeah yeah i think too much of something is like you know can also be like detrimental and it, um, it depends on the person as well yeah for sure i mean like you know some people get drained a lot more easily especially if you've been playing cod for a long time mm-hmm. i've been um, playing since ghost and i definitely can tell that if i'm yeah. doing just cod it's it's terrible I mean, for, me. for me it's black ops too um you're, you're speaking about your experiences before with uh quitting and i just wanted to uh go on another part or a question that i have for you and um what like is the biggest experience now that you've been 18 for two years and competing what's the biggest i guess change uh from the local scene to the major scene that you've experienced hmm it's a good question uh it's definitely the politics uh in the local scene you kind of just like, at least in my case, I just made friends. Like, I became friends with you, became friends with Max, whoever, and we just kind of pl- became friends with Chris outside, and we just kind of played all our locals together, you know? Like, we played together every day. In this scene, you really have to branch out as much as you and in the 18-plus scene, I mean. You really have to branch out as much as you can and try to just... Honestly, you got to be friends with everyone. You can't make enemies. You can't burn bridges because you just never know down the road, like, if this guy's going to be an asset to you or not, you know what I'm saying? So, definitely the politics is the biggest difference you've really got to learn how to like talk to people how to interact with people and like get people on your good side i guess yeah no for sure now like you're saying with how you have to branch out also do you think that different ways of streaming and like i was saying earlier you know content creation could really help because like i was saying to max name another competitive call of duty youtuber you search on youtube like like you go through the timeline you don't see him i know one mm-hmm. other guy his name is salvation's elite and he doesn't even make he makes like reaction videos it's not even really like all that who is, yeah, he, makes, so, he makes a bunch of like comp videos on like stuff that like comp players would know and like it's exactly. kind of like comp, like he'll be like um uh, like i know he covers roster changes a lot and it's like all of us are on top of that especially with like roster mania coming up like then it'll be crucial but like it'll be like octane needs a new team and it's like, well, we've known that since we saw the roster <laughs> drop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, like for sure, exactly what you're saying. Like, there, there's so many, so many opportunities for people, so much potential in that space. But you don't see people making videos as much as they would be turning on the stream and. Screaming yeah, you're you honestly you're right. I'm trying to think. Uh, there's not a lot of people taking advantage of that space, really, other than like pros, I guess. Like Octane makes some tips and tricks videos here and there, but like. Other than that, I can't think of any like up and coming amateur that's actually trying their best to put out content. Which I can't figure out why that is. I think the way the headspace of a lot of people in this community is, they have like an ego to them and they just think it's like I guess cringy would be the word that people would use to like make content like that or whatever and think people would roast them. But like people don't realize there's like levels to this and yeah. Someone like me, I guess, or so- someone that's even above me in the scene, 
in the amateur scene could be making videos like that and you're helping some new kid that's just starting and you could really build a fan base up from that. But yeah, I think it's a lot to do with just a lot of people in this community because like whether you want to admit it or not, we're in a community full of gamers. There's a lot of like insecurities and yeah. social skills or, and social aspects aren't the best. But mm -hmm. I think that a lot of people just care too much about uh, what people are going to think. So no one really seizes the opportunity, you know. It's easier for them to just turn on the stream and do what they do every day than to, you know, get out of their comfort zone, I guess. I think a lot of people, like, when it comes to YouTube, I think a lot of people are discouraged because of how Call of Duty has fallen, like, from Grace, really, in YouTube. I mean, like, mm -hmm. they dominated, like, Call of Duty from Black Ops 2, like, just dominated YouTube along with, like, Minecraft. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, it was huge. Like, literally, you could post, like... TDM match if you go in like double positive, you know what I mean? And if you even had like a small like fan base like it could blow up like that's how big the game was and you know the way it's fallen like Like really off a cliff ever since then I think is a lot is really demoralizing and when people try to come up with ideas They don't really know anything like they, they can't really think of anything because you know Call of Duty is already kind of like a linear game to begin with So, you know, what are they gonna stream like pubs? Yeah, uh I definitely fall victim to that. I've always wanted to, because I, I have a lot of editing skills. Like I feel like I'm good at the digital aspect of things, but I'm just not creative enough. I feel like to consistently make YouTube videos, it takes especially a certain about Call of Duty. A hundred percent. Like I sit here to myself and I'm like, what can I make? What can I make? And I just can't ever think of anything to be honest, other than like good gameplays. Hey bro, I saw your montage and I thought it was dope. I I know yeah, you I see something like that. I liked it and yeah, I was trying to push this movement earlier on. Like, why don't we as players use like montages as a quote unquote like a music video would be in the rap industry, where everyone's kind of like, this is what I have to show, and it's like mm -hmm. this is my artistic way of putting it together. Whether you do it yourself or you have, you pay someone to do it, like back in the day, bro, in Modern Warfare Three and Black Ops Two every pro player had a montage and mm -hmm. everybody watched them they're so dope and i don't understand like it's so easy for people to get clips and to just throw them all together like it's not hard to throw there's so many transitions that you just click drag toss and turn and go they're like people can it's... do it i think that you personally you have the skills that so you could probably go for it mm -hmm. what other ways do you think that you could take that now that you know that that's kind of an avenue that you could lead down I don't know. I, I, I really am good at talking, or maybe I'm not good at it. Maybe people don't think I'm good at it, but I like to talk, you know? I am I talk a lot. So I really, if I was going to create content, I would definitely uh, like to do a lot of live comms and just more so, I don't know, just talk about life, talk about my experiences, and talk about like any knowledge that I do have. That's kind of what I've wanted to do forever. I've never just pulled the trigger on it because... I honestly don't know why. I'm I'm a procrastinator in certain ways, so that's kind of kind of why I haven't. I keep telling myself once Cold War drops, once we have a good game that I actually enjoy, that I'll I'll do that. So I'm gonna try to make myself. I've become a more disciplined person over time, so I think I think next year will be good. I think next year uh, I'll finally make it happen, or at least attempt to. I think it's definitely also gonna be a very big asset to your brand, especially mm -hmm. especially now going back to a four v four. And I want to hear your opinions on how that's going to just change the whole space. Oh, my goodness. It's, yeah, it's crazy. It's going to be insane. Four, oh, did you want to say something? No, no, no. Go, go. Okay, okay. 4v4 is definitely 10 times more competitive. It's definitely the right decision. But I don't know if you guys saw uh, the ESPN article leak that said they wouldn't be expanding this year. Yeah, they're not. Yeah. yeah. So that's going to make things crazy because that instantly tells you that there's 12 players that are on starting rosters right now that will not be on starting rosters next year. Mm -hmm. So instantly, they changed the rules as well. Like this year in Challengers, I don't know how aware you guys are of the rules, but if any person was on a bench, they had to be on a two-way contract to play in Challengers if they were signed to a pro team. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a lot of two-way contracts. And on top of that, say like... Uh, Gunjar was on the bench for Optic, and then Sensor was on the bench for New York. They couldn't play together. You had to be playing with people on your own franchise team. They completely scrapped that. Anyone on the bench can play in Challengers next year, like no matter what, with other bench players. So the Challenger scene, I think it affects the Challenger scene more than anything else. Like the Challenger 100%. scene is going to be insane. Instantly, you have twelve players, so that's three players worth of team, three teams worth of players that are instantly coming down to the amateur scene, and then you, it's kind of like a trickle effect. You've got the top four teams in challengers with five players each 
players are going to be knocked off that, and they're going to go down the ladder, and you know everybody's going to get bumped down a little bit. So it's definitely going to be crazy. I don't know what to the expect. Really, but, again. yeah, it's going to be insane. I can't wait to see who gets picked up, who gets dropped, because not only we were going into next year thinking that maybe a few AMs get picked up and that shuffles rosters around, but now literally every single team in the league has to make a change, and then you kind of balance out like. Is Fellow going to get picked up? Is Parasite going to pick up? Like, you got these AMs that are hoping to get on spots next year. Like, I don't know. It's going to be so insane. Yeah. No, I'm looking at the chat right now. Even Gus Five saying Challengers is going to be more competitive. Than oh, pro so games. competitive. So competitive. Oh, man, it's going to be so, so insane. That's why I, mean, I, I oh, no, 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 go ahead. Go, go, go. I, I have 50 50 feelings on it. Like, I'm 100% all for it. I think it's the best decision possible. Like, it's way more competitive. It's way easier to keep track of. It's a better viewing experience. It's just all around better. Not having to worry about an extra player, especially in the amateur scene, which I'll get back to that, that point in a minute, mm -hmm. is a blessing. Mm -hmm. But it takes away a lot of opportunity from a lot of amateur players that are yeah, hoping to get picked up this year, next year, or in the future. So, yeah, I'm kind of, I have mixed feelings about that part, but it's definitely the better future long term. I mean, the better decision long term for sure. It's a it's a short term sacrifice for the long term. Yeah, you yeah, know, exactly. and um, I th I think I saw saw somewhere. I mean, they're opening it up, uh, <laughs> or ha leaving the possibility to like have extra league spots open up in twenty twenty two. I saw, so, mm -hmm. like you know, I think it's just this year that we're gonna have to go through such like a gladiator pit. I mean, you know, ch with challengers, it's always gonna evolve, and there's gonna be new players. You know, like that's just like the cycle of Call of Duty. But I think uh, this year in particular is gonna be very competitive. Um. But speaking on that, because of how much harder it is now for uh, challenger players to actually become pro, I'm curious, since you've been in uh, the 18 plus scene now for two years, what players do you think, or if they even have a chance at all at becoming pro or getting to that level to getting benched? Because, you know, it's already hard enough with this new, with, with 4v4 now. Do you think there's any player that, from your experience, played with or against that you think could actually make it? So, are you asking like long term or just who I think is going to get picked up this off season? You think any time during the season, could you get benched, Dude, get a pro league spot? It, anything. It's so hard. There's so many players I think that deserve it. I think number one, without a doubt, should be Parasite. He, as much as he's burned bridges, did this, did that. He's without a doubt the most valuable am in the scene. It's not even a debate. He, I think his average am placing this year was like a three point something, like the highest by far. Like it's not even close. Every, yeah, like every team he he joined, he made better. Like you can have your opinions on him, like what you think about him as a person, the moral decisions he's made, whatever else. But when you're talking about as a Call of Duty player, he deserves it more than anyone else, without a doubt. And then someone like Fellow Naga fan, like those guys should not be in the am league. Like those guys are champions; they deserve to be in the league. Uh, and then once you get into the AM side, there's just so many players who I think could deserve it, might get picked up. And that's when you get into like the politics of things. Like someone like Pentagram, he's a close friend of mine. We used to team. I think he should probably already be in the league, but he kind of had some questionable decisions on social media last year that kind of messed with his stock a little bit. So it just depends, I guess. So I'm reading in the chat right now, and I'm just going to read word for word what Gus Fi is saying. So he's saying it's the best decision to also kick in the balls to everyone who is a top AM, etc. The more pro players that come to challengers, the less actual challengers, AMs, make it. Makes it mm -hmm. even harder unless the franchises are required to have an academy team, and that would be mm -hmm. a great stepping stool to at least the top tier AMs. Naga played second at AW Champs and won Gen G last year, and he didn't get on a pro team. So, yep. yeah, Same. no, I, I agree 100% with Gusify on that uh, yeah. academy team point. And uh, especially speaking on the point of new organizations and, like, stepping stools, you guys know how back in the day, at least in, like, Black Ops 3 and AW, like, there were organizations everywhere, and these random people were just starting organizations and just throwing money into it just to hop mm -hmm. on the wave. It was everywhere. Do you think that that same kind of flood is going to happen this year? Because it's also kind of died down. You don't see as many big name orgs, or do you think it's just all long gone? Uh, I think the amateur scene, as far as organization wise, is definitely dying. I experienced that firsthand this year. Finding an organization to represent was a struggle. I mean, I'm talking like even teams that were consistently in the top eight all year long, like we're having trouble finding orgs. Like, there's just no profit for them. There's no like, it's just not a good long term investment, to be honest. I think a lot of people are realizing that. You kind of have, especially in a league that. Is franchise like Call of Duty? There's just there's no way for you to get in unless you're gonna go out and raise twenty five million dollars. Or the only other way you could possibly be profitable or just have a good long term business model is if you're consistently poaching 
or have a really good eye for talent, and then you're locking these players into contracts and then selling them to franchise teams, hoping they get picked up. But I mean, that's just so like so much of a coin flip. Like you sign this guy, you don't know for sure if a franchise is ever going to pick him up. So there's just no possible way for them to make it a long-term business. So no, I think the amateur scene, as far as organization-wise, is going down, down, down. And I don't see that changing next year either. But again, uh, you mentioned... He mentioned the Academy League. I don't think that's possible either because you've seen it in Overwatch. Overwatch had an Academy League and almost every Overwatch team pulled out. It's just so much of a financial burden that it's just impossible to sustain. You're having these teams that are paying 25 mil plus for a spot and then you're telling them, okay, you played that 25 mil plus. Now you need to go create an Academy team and pay those guys as a bonus like you can't you can't do that you can't force the team to do that you know because that wasn't a thing in the league in the first place there's probably a lot of teams that would like to do it but i also know there te- there's teams that wouldn't want to do it like someone like phase like they had an academy team that was like the only one this year but say huntsman like hex hex talked about it on the last podcast he just doesn't see it fit for his brand because all he would be doing is Someone, someone as big as his organization and his brand, all he would be doing is picking up these amateur players for the Huntsman Academy, and then he's building up their brands just to make them more profitable for another team. You know, he's, he's like selling off his fans, if that makes sense. Because Scump, mm-hmm. Formal, those guys aren't going anywhere. So he's given these amateur players a platform just for them to get picked up by the Empire one day or something, and then, you know, a chunk of his fans are going there. So... I don't think the Academy League is going to have anytime soon. I don't think it's going to work. It would just be too much of a financial burden on all the teams, and I don't think a lot of the teams would want to go that route, to be honest. As much as I would love it, I just don't think it's uh, possible right now. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I feel like the Academy League would be like a fantastic idea and like a fun idea, but I think it just wouldn't work out in the long run. Um, so I think in turn what you get is, I remember, I think it was COD Gamepedia tweeted out after 4v4 got announced and no expansion got announced that, all this means for this year is that Activision and CDL and Treyarch just have to pay <clears throat> that much more attention to Challengers because mm-hmm. it's going to be a gauntlet. Uh, yeah, I definitely think there's ways around, like, I think there's ways for them to improve the Challenger scene in a lot of ways. They could change the format. There needs to be more broadcast. There needs to be... Yeah. I, I think it's some type of weird rule that the league has with YouTube that they can't stream on two accounts at once, so there can't be, like, a call of duty challengers stream you know what i'm saying or a channel mm-hmm. so the only time they were able to stream challengers tournaments this year is when there wasn't a pro tournament they couldn't do it at the same time so that kind of messed the things so i think that needs to be changed there needs to be constant broadcast like these these franchises have to be able to watch these streams and see who's who and you know it just helps with scouting purposes but the actual academy league just won't happen anytime soon i know everyone compares it and says like the nba has the g league this that well the reality is sports at the moment are 10 times more profitable than esports esports at the moment is in a climate where teams are just finding ways to become profitable in the first place let alone it's a huge investment yeah it's a huge investment like most of these esports teams aren't profitable at the moment so any kind of financial burden like that just isn't realistic right now now once we get to a point where all these sports teams are profitable like these nba teams and they're worth hundreds of millions of dollars then it's not as much of a financial burden you see what i'm saying but we're such a new esports is such a new concept that it just doesn't work the same as traditional sports yeah and like you're saying it doesn't work the same at all so it Mm -hmm. it, it's going to be definitely so much harder for these amateurs to really come through and make that light and what are you what do you think are some of the best ways that these amateurs can provide value not only to their brands but other brands that they are associated with hopefully later on in their career okay uh, ask that question again i kind of like so like what are what are some of the best ways you think people can bring value to themselves as well as uh organization they might possibly join uh, honestly i've always been a big believer that there's two ways for you to make it in this industry you either have to be an undeniable talent or you have to bring something else as far as brand awareness or something like that. So the only way you're going to do that is if, one, you're a simp, you're an undeniable talent, you turn 18, like the pros just can't deny your talent and you're in the league straight up. That's just how it is. Or it comes back down to the politics, networking, all that stuff. You just have to be really good at that stuff. You need to be creating content. You need to be networking with people. You need to be becoming friends with people that, you know, can benefit you in some way in the future. And I know that sounds like, like a lot of people have this weird... I see so many tweets all the time. They're like, 
that they'll never get cried or whatever. But you're just an idiot if you think that. Like, that's just not a good mindset at all. Like, it's not dick riding. You're just, it's literally networking. Like, you have to network. You have to know how to do it. You have to become friends with the right people. And then if you're doing all that, at that point, you just have to get lucky. Like, as, as crazy as it sounds, you just have to be lucky enough to get your chance. And then once you do get an opportunity, you cannot screw it up. Like, opportunities don't constantly come. If you get your shot, you have to show up. Like, imagine, like, let me give an example. Tom Brady, back when Bledsoe was injured, he gets put on the starting lineup. Imagine he does that and doesn't go and win the Super Bowl. He is an average quarterback or below average. Do we? It's not the same anymore, right? He, he, does, he probably doesn't get another shot. He probably rides the bench, and that's that. Once you get your opportunity, you have to seize the day. You have to seize the opportunity. So... It's just, it's a lot of luck. It's a lot of preparation. And that's that. Like, there's nothing much else you can do at that point. You've done everything you can. If you do all those things and you still don't make it, that's just, that's part of life, you know? Not everything goes your way. And that's another reason I said you have to have a backup plan. I'm all for chasing your dream. I'm all for, like, taking risks at a young age and all that. But you just have, in the back of your mind, you have to be prepared for what happens, what comes next if this doesn't work out, you know? Because at the end of the day, with 44 going next year, there's 48 spots in the Pro League. 48 people in the entire world will be a professional Call of Duty next, player next year. So at the end of the day, you just got to look at the odds. You got to be realistic and realize that, all right, if this doesn't work out, what am I going to do? And if you really want to, if you really, really, really want this to be your job, then you have to be taking the right steps. You can't be lazy about things. You like, you should be doing things the correct way. You should be creating content. You should be being a good teammate. You should be giving 150% to your craft, you know what I'm saying? I see a lot of players, you'll you'll run into this now that you're 18, Liam, you'll see. There's a lot of players who half-ass this, they half-ass practice, they half-ass just everything. They're just lazy in general. There's a lot of lazy people in this community. And then they complain while they're not making progress, while they're not in the spot they want to be. So if you're not doing the things that you need to do, I think it's pretty straightforward, then you're not going to find the success that you want to find. Yeah, I feel like I've come across... Um... I know I'm touching. A, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I know I'm touching a lot of points at once. By the way, I'm just kind of. Yeah, no, it's perfect. Bro. Yeah. It, no, it you're good, so bro. Gives us ideas yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, like this is where this is about to come from. But um, like I'm 18 now, and I took break World War II, Black Ops 4, whatever. Mm-hmm. But throughout that like 13 uh, year old to 16 year old period, I feel like you come across a lot of guys, whether they're older or younger than you, that are really big on like, oh, it's just scrims. It's not that serious. It's just a free XP, it's not that serious. I don't need to shoot my bots, whatever it is. And I feel like those are the same people that we're going to see in a couple of years are going to be 25 and still making no progress because they just don't take things as seriously. And just let me say it now, you said like the 13 to 16 range. I know you think once you turn 18, you get into the like older generation of players. It is the same exact way. There's people who half-ass practice, half-ass everything they're doing in this. And there's a, they're the same people that aren't giving themselves a backup plan, giving themselves an out. And then they complain or just they make excuses when they don't find the success they want to find. And I, I've been victim to this. Like, I quit twice. I, I had a good opportunity in BO4 to make something happen, to build my brand, to you know, be in a much better position than I am now. And I fumbled the bag. I quit like an idiot. And I accepted that. I didn't make excuses about it. And I've realized that I have to grind my way back to the top. And I, every day I try to do my best. But there's, you'll run into that all the time. And that's another part of the luck aspect. You have to, the stars have to align and you have to, I guess three now, you have to find three people who are all on the same page, all want to achieve the same goal, are all mature enough to do that. And it's hard. It is not Hopefully with 4v4, to it's going to be a lot easier, man. That fifth person... It was oh, already yeah. hard enough. I mean, Chris, already you, made it hard. I, I, know, I know you can relate to this, Chris, but it was already hard enough to find a fourth. And five mm-hmm. five just made it near impossible, man. Yep. So. And and even when you even if you have four players, getting all four of those players to be on the same page, to give good effort, to really like I don't know about you guys, but I cannot team with people who don't if you don't want to make this career, if you're not giving this hundred fifty percent, then I don't want you on my team. I don't care how talented you are if you're half passing practice, if you're not going over VODs, if you're not showing if you're showing up late, like I won't deal with it. Like I dealt with that so much this year. I literally qualified for amateur champs and didn't even scrim. For amateur champs my team did not scrim for it so I, i'm very very uh experienced in the bullshit that happens in the amateur bracket and let me tell you it's not fun but you just gotta 
do everything in your power, whether that's content creating, becoming a better player yourself. And then you have to hope that the guys around you are doing the same, you know. But if you're not doing what you need to do first, then you have no excuse. It doesn't matter what the people around you are doing. I don't. And a lot of people will be like, well, this guy's not doing it, so I'm not doing it. Like, then you don't want it. Yeah. I never once said, all right, well, my teammates being a bad teammate and not doing this, so I'm going to be late every day. And I'm like, you know what I'm saying? You can't. Two wrongs don't make a right. That's not how the world works. You have to constantly be doing everything in your power to make it. And then eventually, if you're good enough and you're doing all those things, whether you like it or not, you'll get recognized by someone and you'll climb up the ladder. That's how it works. Uh, you said how you know this year you dealt a lot with you know lazy teammates or teammates who didn't actually want to put in the small stuff. Um, I'm just mm-hmm. curious since I know you know I know you, Chris. Uh, I was wondering if there's anything you wanted to do as a teammate that you weren't able to do because your teammates didn't want to do it because they thought it was tedious or it's not something they wanted to do or they didn't think it was beneficial or something like oh, yeah. that. And to be fair, I think a lot of that was because of the game. Like modern, it's no secret, Modern Warfare was a terrible COD. A lot of people hated it, didn't have fun, you know, and it's hard to do the extra things when you're not enjoying yourself, you know? But that's, mm. again, if you want to make this a career, you have to do it. Job, treat uh, it like a job. Yep, treat it like a job, exactly. But, um, yeah, I mean, everything, bro. Like, VODs, going over stuff in custom games, going over s and i I've changed so many rosters so many times and trying to get people to show up for VOD se- sessions, trying to get people to show up to... I mean, I, I literally had teammates oversleeping for 4.30 p.m. scrims this year. Like, just unacceptable stuff like that. Like... It just can't happen. And if you're if you're recognizing that someone around you is doing those things, you just got to cut them loose. Like you can't. Don't be an idiot and leave them leave them by your side. You just gotta get out of there as fast as you can because it's only gonna hold you back. But also, don't be the guy that's making all the excuses about everyone else. If you're doing what you can do, if you're doing everything in your power, then at the end of the day, that's all you can do, and that's that. You know. Yeah. No. Uh, you were saying how. Some of these people just wake up at 4 p.m. and mm-hmm. the, uh, they'll be late for their scrims. Gus, I was saying earlier, yeah. Shoxy, here he is, winning scrims, <laughs> and he's, you know, waking up late for scrims a week before the biggest tournament of his life, and it's like, wait, say that again, say that again. Okay, so Gus, I was saying that Shoxy was waking up late for scrims a week before. Okay, yeah, yeah, Shoxy, Sh- Shoxy's an am, by the way. Mm-hmm. I don't misinterpret that with Shotzi. No, I, I didn't. I actually did think he said Shotzi. I yeah, 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 yeah. Shotzi. Okay. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, Shotzi's an amateur, but yeah, he uh, yeah. he qualified for the Am Champs, and yeah, he was oversleeping like every day before yeah, Champs. No, it was I a big thing that. on Twitter. Yeah, no. but yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to come at that guy, but that's just unacceptable. Like that, that's not how the, those things work. Can't. I will make it a mission of mine this coming year to not surround myself with those kind of people, and that's all you can do. Just don't, my biggest, my biggest message is just don't be one of those guys that see other people being lazy and then you give in that same level of effort. And then at the end of the year, you're asking yourself, why, why am I not where I want to be? Why didn't things go better for me this year? It's probably because as much as you want to blame other people, because you didn't do everything you could do to make it happen straight up. And I know it can, I've been there. I know it can be like bad on your mental. It can be demoralizing. You want to quit. You want to give up. And if you do quit, like there's no shame in that. Like I don't think so anyways. If you decide that this isn't for you, then that's fine. But don't be the same guy that comes back six months later and complains about where he's at, you know? You yeah. did that to yourself and it's no one else's fault. Yeah, I was going to ask this earlier and someone actually asked me on one of my videos, which it's going to be one of my next topics, is what struggles do you find personally that you didn't have the first time you tried to get into the cod community but when you quit and you tried to come back do you think that there was some kind of stigma like oh this kid's a quitter i'm on oh. the team with him like how much did it absolutely change? uh yeah i mean when i came back i was playing with people that i wouldn't have dreamed of playing with like no ego intended back when i was first competing but again i wasn't gonna sit there i didn't complain on twitter i didn't sit there and tweet like why am I playing with this guy? Why isn't people picking me up? I just grinded, got better at the game. Because when I first came back, I wasn't very good in the first place. I had not played in six months, and mm-hmm. I definitely wasn't as good as when I was grinding. But instead of sitting there complaining about like why this was happening to me, I knew it was because I quit. People moved on. They're not going <clears> to <throat> reminisce about Chris Radial and how good he was, this and that. Like It's just straight up. And I just did the, I did the networking thing that I've been preaching. I grinded every single day, and I didn't end up exactly where I wanted to be, obviously, but barring the circumstances of quitting, not having a lot of pro points, not having pretty much starting from scratch, I made the year as successful as I could have, I guess. 
So definitely, just again, just you can't make excuses. You can't do any of that. You just have to do everything in your power, and it'll work out. I promise. If you're good enough, if you're skilled in, in it, obviously skill is a lot. Like if you're not good enough, there's some people that just aren't good enough. Straight up, that sucks, but it's just how it is. But if you are good enough and you do everything that you're supposed to be doing and not make excuses for yourself, it'll work out. You'll climb up the ladder, and you'll it'll work out for you. You know. It's a process. I'm nowhere. I'm not talking like I've made it or even, I'm even close. I, I have a long way to go, but you, you'll make progress if you do the right steps. But yeah, absolutely. When you first quit or you first come back, it's incredibly hard. I wanted to give up so many times, but you just had. You just got to get on every day, grind it out, give your best effort. You know. Yeah. So I know Liam's kind of in that position right now. What steps <laughs> are you personally taking to better yourself to the point that? when you do have the chance to compete this year that you feel you'll be as prepared, you're not going to be lacking behind. Like, you know, I personally feel I felt victim to, and I know a lot of other people have. That question for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, for me personally, I mean, you know, uh, I've been kind of slacking right now. Like like I said, I have to make a decision quite soon, like really soon within the, within the next few weeks. And... Um, if that is COD, which I'm pretty sure it will be, I have to, I mean, I have to, like, completely start from scratch again. I mean, I have connections. I have Chris, you know, I have Max, I have Scrappy, you know, I have, like, all those, like, the people, like, close to me. But, like, a lot of the people who, you know, I guess supported me, you know what I mean? Or a lot of people who I had on my Twitter account. Like, I lost 400 followers in, like, a year. Do you know what I mean? Like, I had 1,200 followers and now I have 850. So it's, like, you know, a bunch of the people who were in the COD scene, like, stopped following me. I had some pros who unfollowed me. Illy unfollowed me, like I had Zuma who, un Zuma who unfollowed me, you know, and uh, not that I was talking to these guys, you know, regular anyways, but they unfollowed me because I wasn't, you know, talking COD, you know, I was tweeting out about basketball or I was tweeting about other things. So I think for me personally, it's, uh, I think this podcast is something that's going to help because, you know, now that I'm just at least doing this and I'm talking about COD and my tweets are more transitioning into COD, uh, you know, I'm slowly getting back into the swing of things. I'm going to start playing, you know, um, tournaments again, like just like these throwback tournaments, trying to get back to where I was. Uh, I don't think it'll take that long. It'll take like two weeks of grinding. Is uh, I mean, I I played a World War II league like a few a few months back, and it took me about like two weeks to get back to genuinely how good I felt I was when I quit. Uh, it was a tough two weeks, but you know I, I grinded my ass off and and I got to where I wanted to. But I'm not I'm not too all nervous about it. It's more me trying to find people, um, in the 18 plus scene. Uh, that's what I really need to worry about. So, what do you think are some ways that you can find new people through the 18 plus scene? Because, like you were saying, you have people like Mac, and, or I said Mac, Max, uh, Chris, and Scrappy in them. But, you know, as, as easy as it is for them to just be like, hey, yo, my man needs a team, go play with uh, them. I can help with this. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Straight up, I'm going to be honest, you have the gold, a lot of people don't believe this, but you have the golden opportunity when you're a fresh face on the scene. When you're in a new blood 18 year old, you, you, the way it works in the cock community is people form an opinion about you and it's incredibly hard to change that opinion, you know? Once people have a set idea of how good you are or like your personality or whatever else, how you are as a player, it's super hard to change that opinion. But when you're a new face, you're a new 18 year old, nobody knows you. If you just come out the gates and you're streaming and you're frying people and you're like, People will give you props right away. They'll be like, okay, this kid's really good. Let's give this kid a chance. And then once you get that chance, if you continue to fry, boom, you're right there. Like, you're, you're, you're in that group. You're in that echelon of players, and you're, you're set. So when just take advantage of when you first turn 18. That's something I didn't do. I played at one event and then quit like an idiot. I wish I wouldn't have. I regret it every day. But just take advantage of the fact that no one has an opinion on you, and you can come out the gate and kind of plant that in their mind of like who you are as a player how good you are i think uh for me personally i mean like you know i remember you telling me about that a few weeks ago chris and um mm -hmm. whether this is a good or bad thing like i mean you know blind blind confidence you know i have a lot of confidence in myself and i know like i mean we've had all these conversations on these podcasts i've had a lot of private conversations with you chris and uh like with max and a bunch of my, like other of my close friends in the cod scene and i like you know i know what steps i need to take i need to network better that's on twitter and you know twitch and youtube yeah uh, i think i'll definitely focus more towards the twitch side than the youtube at the current moment um 
But, you know, I, I, my work ethic with Call of Duty is going to be the same that it always has. I've always been, like, someone who, you know, focused on the right stuff, always put in the right amount of hours. I was never late to scrims. So, for me personally, it's just kind of getting back into the swing of things soon during the uh, off season, and just kind of not using the first two weeks of Cold War as a time for me to get my skill back and using the off season for that and kind of throwing myself back into the community, which I'm really not too worried about. I mean, like, if there's a 10s or I guess eights lobby, thank God now, but <laughs> if there's an eights lobby going on in Cold War, you know what I mean? It's like a bunch of ams. Like, I'm sure I could literally just like be like, yo, Chris, like, Mm. let me hop in the cord you know what yep. i mean it's that simple of course you know because i'm close with you so it's like i can do that now i'm mm -hmm. not i might not get picked but if you're a captain then you pick me and then you know and you play well you know and like, oh who's the sigma kid i'll be like oh exactly he's a new 18 year old and like, oh this kid's pretty good that's how it works that's exactly how it exactly. works it sounds so simple but that's quite literally how it works yep. and as far as like the twitch youtube thing i think twitch is much easier and much more beneficial for the competition side as far as players themselves like seeing your talent and getting picked up on better teams but as far I think YouTube's much better as far as the brand awareness side and what you can bring to like a franchise long term. So I think YouTube's more beneficial long term because I, I heard you say you were going to focus more on Twitch than YouTube is why I bring this up. But I think like making YouTube content and growing a brand that way is better for the long term. But just streaming child streaming tournaments and just players in the community seeing how good you are, that's definitely better for the short term as far as like finding good teammates and stuff. I mean, I, I meant for like Twitch, like right out the gate, I would focus more on Twitch because I yeah, have exactly. more that's, that's my point. And, and yep. it's, you know, it's a new COD and it's like, mm -hmm. you know, big, like, uh, what's it called? Like, what are the tournaments called? Like the first S&D tournaments? Uh, the kickoffs? Yeah, the kickoffs, right, right, right. So I'd stream the kickoffs and yep. like, you know, other chows and stuff like the big tourneys. And, and um, the the YouTube side of it, like I have, I have ideas, you know what I mean? Am I the mm -hmm. right personality? Who knows? Like, you know... I, I can think of ideas that can fit, fit around my personality. Like, I mean, you mentioned it before, how you were talking about things, really educating people on, like, COD. Like, I mean, you never see people. Like, I remember I watched Merck in, um, back in World War II, right? And he was a coach mm -hmm. or an analyst, right? And he went mm -hmm. off and he did this thing where in World War II, where I'm sure, honestly, may, many of you probably don't even know this. Chris might. I'm not sure about John or Kobe, but it was, like, this thing in World War II where it was, like, the line rule in Hardpoint, Right. He was like, draw a line through every hard point, right? Just straight through it, like horizontally across the map. And it was like, as long as if you, those are the three spawn points you want to cut off because it maximizes, like at least for most of the maps or every single map on World War II, it would push out the spawns the farthest. And like, I, I didn't really focus on like Call of Duty back then, but I was mind blown because I thought about it. And on like P2 on, on London Dog's hard point, if you controlled the hill, you controlled coal, and then you controlled back lights or whatever the callout was. I forgot the callout, right? Mm -hmm. It would make them spawn all the way back water steps, like completely across the map. Do you know what yep. I mean? And then when you apply that to literally every single hard point on every single hill, it worked the exact same way, and it blew my mind because it made COD you so much easier. That? Oh yeah, no, because I, I, you know, I was an SD kid, and keep, mm -hmm. keep in mind I was fourteen, turning fifteen in that yeah. game. So it's like. Oh. Right as I learned that, I realized how much I could study games. So then right as I learned that, I got addicted to watching VODs. I literally watched Gunless for ages. Like, I literally, because I was a hybrid, I played, uh, or a flex, I guess. Hybrids don't really exist, but a flex, uh, like, I played AR on um, on the AR maps and the subs on the sub maps. I eventually turned into a full-blown AR, but, um, you know, it's, like, crazy how fast you can learn and, like, the small stuff like that. And those are the types of videos I would want to do because I feel like no one does it. Not even pros do it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the hard, hard point's incredibly simple, especially other than Modern Warfare, of course. You know, that's just a shit show, but yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, no, man, and Liam, like you were saying, you don't know if you have the right personality for it or et cetera. I think, first of all, I think you do. Two, I think that in this community alone, there's a lot of people, like we were saying earlier, they're super anti-social to begin with that are, have a super hard time putting themselves out there. So if you can get over that obstacle, you know, rip that bandaid off and just sit down like, right. you know, Fizzerp used to upload videos where he literally would sit down and he would just draw with like Google picture, like all over the screen and just do the stupidest shit, but it would get views. People would retweet it all over Twitter. It was, everybody talked about Fizzerp videos back in Ghost and Black Ops yeah. 2. Like, I mean, they were the shit, man. Like all those nade spots. Anything like that, bro. 10 second videos, but it's like the fact that you even got it up there. That's a whole different Nine percent of the battle is just doing, just starting. It's funny too, cause like I, honestly, I'm sure you guys all can agree with this. The COD community really demeans that shit. Like they think it's silly. 
Oh yeah, like I said, people would be like, calling it cringe. I mean, that's just yeah. how Twitter is. It's how socials are. People just spread hate. You just got to ignore those kind of people. Just who cares what they think? Those are the guys that aren't going to make it anywhere because they have those weird mindsets. So just let them rock. Yeah. Yeah. Now Gus Fi is sitting here talking in chat. Saying, <laughs> I know he. <laughs> he's talking about when you were talking about the hard point rule, and he said it's insane how people have played variant for years and still have no clue how to work this spawn. Crazy, right? Yeah. Insane, Gus. People like focus mind on gun skill only when there's a very small part of the competing, in my opinion. Once you get to a point, everybody shoots straight. Some shoot a bit straighter, and then uh, it's to an extent, it's all about knowledge. So what other ways than, like he was saying, it's not all about just shooting straight, because anybody can do that. Anybody can, you know, learn that in-game knowledge. And what ways do you think that you can stand out from the rest? Because, you know, we're talking about providing value as a player, and it doesn't just have to be about content creation, but in the way of like, you know, you you get onto the team and say you know everything up to date, et cetera. Like you're you're on top of the ball of something. What things do you think that you as a person could focus on individually that could really help your team? Uh, so are you asking me what I personally can do, or what I would be recommending like what someone you, else? I mean, if. if However you want to take it, if you want to say personally what you think you your best trait could be and how you can play that card, because I'm sure a lot of other people can take that and run with it. Yeah, I think a lot of, I think what I've noticed with a lot of players and they don't recognize it is just communication. Communicating with your team in the right way is, I think, the most important part of COD. Obviously, gun skills, another factor, and then game knowledge is another, but that comes with playing. If you're grinding every day with a set team, you guys, are, unless you're just idiots, you're going to figure out how to play the game. You're going to figure out how to optimize what works best for you. And you're going to be good, or else most people will be. So <clears throat> learning how to work the map with a teammate, small talking, is huge. And I think that's a big problem with a lot of people. You hear a lot of comms, especially with AM teams, where it's just constant. He's here, he's here, he's one shot here, I died here, this, that. It's not, hey, I'm pushing this, follow me up. Hey, I'm preaming this, hold this for me. You know, having it, you're... The way the map should work when you're competing, it should be a conversation between you and your teammates on the map. It shouldn't be just everyone running around, calling out who's dead, who's not. That's that's useless stuff. Like you, you have a kill feed, you have a mini map, we know that stuff. I think the biggest thing a lot of amateurs need to focus on is their communication. Uh, so yeah, communication definitely is what a lot of people should focus on. It's And that's the one thing that no matter what, it takes no skill to have. Anyone can communicate properly. If you aren't the most talented player, and there goes Liam, if you aren't uh, the most talented player, like that's that. You can't. You can try to shoot some bots, change that. But at the end of the day, there's no excuse for having bad communication. Period. Yeah. And what other ways do you think communication can play a big part into your team's aspect, other than in game? Because obviously uh, there can be yeah. that that out of game disconnect. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think a big problem with a lot of teams is when a player is struggling or players doing something wrong they don't they go about it the wrong way they either like kind of go at that person in front of everyone or they go off and dm their other teammates and be like bro like chris is doing this wrong like why is chris doing this bro instead i think the most constructive way to do that is if i as a player recognize that hey my teammate's struggling with this or i notice he's not doing this right and like my teammates are dming me side on the side like saying like yo like this guy's gotta go or this guy's gotta fix this i would dm i would get him on a call separately and be like hey man Listen, I've noticed, I've been watching VOD, you're doing this wrong. Like, sit him down one-on-one -on -one and talk to him about it and tell him what he can improve on. Maybe watch his VOD with him. Stuff like that. And that goes back to giving the best effort. You should be doing everything in your power to make your team better. If you think you're in a position to where you can help one of your teammates be better, you should be doing that. But you have to do it in a positive way that doesn't, like, kill their vibe. Because vibes are a big part of COD. I've been on teams where the vibe is just absolutely killed. For example, my champs team this last year, like this last, my champs team just a couple weeks ago, probably the most talented roster I've been on this year, but half my teammates hated each other, half of them thought the other half weren't good, blah, 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 blah. So, I mean, we got last of champs. I mean, so you definitely just need to learn to critique players in the proper way in order to maintain like a cohesive team bond and not like kill the vibe because once the vibe's chalked it's hard to get that back once people start disliking each other like taking personal shots or just feeling uncomfortable it's it, it the whole thing will crumble I know uh, I have a, oh, no. go ahead Liam. all right, all right. so uh, you made it you made a point talking about uh, how the vibes um really matter do you think in 
Call of Duty. Mm-hmm. But um, because like you know, in sports, a lot of time you hear a lot of people saying that you don't have to like your teammate because as long as you have good chemistry on the floor, right? Mm-hmm. And and it was interesting because you know I thought about that with Call of Duty, and I was like, you know, I just, I don't think it's the same because you know when you go out and go do a physical sport like that, do you know what I mean? You don't need to engage with the same way that you do um in call of duty you know you're exerting mm-hmm. yourself versus sitting down with someone for eight hours sometimes exactly in a call, that, sometimes more you're talking yep. to them you know it's a whole different relationship mm-hmm. so for me personally i think that you need to like your teammates i think everyone needs to like themselves i mean yep. there's teams that i mean you look at optic like a couple of years back you know they were some of the they were the most talented team in the game right but they didn't like each other so they, they didn't translate mm-hmm. to win so what, what's your opinion on that if you could expand on that more yeah, it's definitely not the same. In a traditional sport, you're going to practice for an hour or two, you're with each other, and then say you have a game or something. Like, that's that. That's three hours out of the day. In COD, the way, just the way esports work, not just COD, the only way to practice is to compete in the same way that you are in official matches, and that's just grinding scrims all day, grinding VOD together. I mean, this is you've got to put in eight hours a day as a squad. So you're just around each other so much that it becomes virtually impossible to not like each other and still be a good team it takes a really really mature group of people to do that and as i said before in the amateur scene finding three four guys that even will put in the correct amount of effort and want to do everything that the team needs to do to be better is hard enough so finding a group of people that are mature enough to not like each other as people and still want to achieve one goal is like it's not going to happen i'm going to be straight up It, it won't happen so maintaining the team vibe has to be a priority because once people start not liking each other it's just going to crumble people are going to start sketching it's just how it works so when you get a group of people <clears throat> together and you know you are all kind of on the same path what mm-hmm. ways do you think that um you know we were saying that you, you sit there and play for eight hours 12 hours a day etc but do you think if you have that group chemistry you guys are all on that same wavelength that you guys all kind of think uh, outside the box, per se, do you think there is a way that you could get ahead of your competitors without playing as much as those people? Because regardless, you still have to play. You still have to get your hours in, stay warm so you can shoot back. You still have to get your name known. People know that you play all the time, etc. But what ways do you think that you could really get ahead of the competition and still put time on other things? Uh, honestly, I have yet to find a team other than my very first team when I turned 18, that had, what you said, a group of guys that were all on the same wavelength, all dedicated enough to be doing the proper things. So I couldn't really tell you. That's tough. It, like I said, it's virtually impossible to find an amateur scene. That's why it's a struggle, a very, very rough struggle getting out of the amateur scene into the league. But at the end of the day, there's no way to get ahead of your competitors or other teams unless you're doing all the things I listed. You have to be scrimming every single day. You have to be putting in the hours. And on top of that, you have to be studying other teams. Like You should be studying pro teams. What do these guys do? What, like my team at the end of Black Ops 4, we would every day after scrims, this is the team I was talking about that actually was on the same page, we would watch spots of ourselves, critique those mistakes, and then we would go watch a pro VOD. We'd go watch 100 Thieves on See, my team had like a Google Doc, and we'd have map records of our scrims. So we'd recognize, okay, we're bad at Hacienda. Let's go watch 100 Thieves on Hacienda. Okay, this hill, they're doing this. They're sending three arrows this way, two arrows this way. You really have to go in depth with those things if you want to win. Like a lot of people, a lot, I mean, a lot of people get on every day, play two scrims, get off. They think that's good enough. They think at the end of the day, you just got to fry. You just got to show up on tournament day and fry. Like that's not how it works. If you truly want to win, you should be going the extra mile because the guys at the top are doing that stuff. All the guys that are actually winning do that stuff. And if you want to get to that point, you have to put in more effort than them. Not the same, not definitely not less. So at the end of the day, I don't think there is a way for you to kind of slack. If you want to make this a career, you have to do more than your competitors. You have to be putting in more work than the guy next to you or else he will succeed. That was and you won't. the perfect response I was looking for. I was hoping that you were going <laughs> to come out with that i was really hoping you weren't going to come out with some cop out like oh yeah just do this or that because i i guarantee there there could be so many ways people could think about it but uh definitely not there's no cop out in in this industry there's no cop out for it if you want to be like i said there's 48 spots if you want to be in the one percent of the one percent you have to put in the effort of the one percent of the one percent 
You can't put in average effort. You can't half-ass things. You have to put in the proper effort. You have to take the proper preparations. Like That's just how it works. And like I said, that's super hard to find. It's incredibly hard to find. If you find that with four guys that are all willing to do that, you are blessed to take advantage of that opportunity. But no matter what, you as an individual should still be doing those things. If I have teammates that aren't going to do it, I'll still do my part. So speaking on preparation, and John and Liam, personally, I think we should make this part like a little hot take thing because mm-hmm. we've done it with the past two guests. I'm going to bring it back right now. Mm-hmm. So Chris, what are your – and they like they don't have to be new. You could have already listed them. Mm-hmm. What are your three off-season tips that people should be doing? In this off-season? Mm-hmm. Yes. Ooh. Idea, Cole. Uh, definitely oh, play. Yeah. <laughs> Play, play and stream as much COD as possible. Try to interact with new people, new faces, whether that's getting into eights lobbies, getting into whatever. And what should be the third thing? Hmm. Just don't bring yourself any negative attention. Just try to... I think the best... I don't think the off-season is the best time to really climb up the ladder much like like i said mw just happened people form their opinions off that game you're not really gonna vary too much so just don't do anything stupid don't make any enemies don't get in stupid twitter beef arguments just kind of lay low grind some cod stay like stream some so that way people aren't just forgetting about you like oh like just stay relevant enough but don't don't burn any bridges and just don't make any enemies just kind of lay low wait for the new game to come out and make something happen once because at the beginning of the game the opportunity, the field is wide open. Anyone can make anything happen at the beginning of a COD. So just don't do anything stupid. Just don't make any enemies. Don't screw yourself for the next year. Just kind of lay low, play some COD, and that's it. Perfect. I don't, I, yeah, I don't yeah. think there's too much that you can do. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And I think that that's a good note to wrap it up on. We're at 57 minutes, man. That did not feel like it. I felt like yeah, it's weird. flew by. We were talking about it on the last one, but... uh. Anyway, I hope everybody listening, we had about five people in here constantly, so I'm in. You know, you got that again, but uh, <laughs> I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Chris, as well, have a great rest of the day. All of the apps yeah, are man. on screen, so everybody on here should be getting a follow. Hope you guys stay safe. Peace. That was good, man.